COVID cases are rising again, along with variants of the virus. The World Health Organization says it wants its experts to return to China to find out more about the origins of the disease. So how much of a danger is this wave? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mohammed Jamjoum. Only four years ago, the name COVID hadn't even been invented. But today, it's a term known the world over after the worst pandemic in living memory. How it started is unknown. But what is known is that it's still very much around. The extent is less than before, but latest figures show incidence of the disease is on the rise. There are many variants, too, as the virus mutates and develops as it spreads. That presents challenges to scientists working on developing vaccines that can cope with the new threats. COVID-19 cases are on the rise in some countries. The World Health Organization says nearly 1.5 million new infections and more than 2,500 deaths have been reported from July to early August. The number of infections was up 80% on the previous month. The cases are driven by new variants. The WHO says it's concerned about the spread in the Northern Hemisphere. Governments are approving updated vaccines to tackle the new forms. COVID-19 has killed nearly 7 million people since it was first detected in China in late 2019. The Financial Times has reported that the World Health Organization chief wants the WHO experts to be allowed to return to China for more investigations into how the disease started. A report after a previous visit was inconclusive. The two main theories are that the disease was transferred from animals to humans at a food market in Wuhan or from a leak from the city's virology laboratory. The WHO chief says the answer is not known conclusively, but will be found. Before we talk to our panel of guests, let's first speak with Dr. Maria Van Kerkhove, who is the COVID-19 technical lead at the World Health Organization. Dr. Van Kerkhove, thanks so much for being with us today on Inside Story. Uh, let me ask you first about the fact that the WHO is urging China to offer more information on the origins of COVID-19 and is ready to send a second team there to probe the matter. Have you all received any response from China thus far? Well, I mean, as you've pointed out, we still don't know how this pandemic began. And four years on, this question remains vitally important, not only to understand how this one began, but to prevent the next one. So we have been working with our colleagues in China diplomatically, scientifically to advance our understanding. And we need collaboration. We need cooperation through scientific study, through different missions. We've actually had several missions to China, and we had always envisioned that there would be more missions to follow up the different hypotheses to better understand early data collection, early cases, the importance of the market, any potential breach in biosafety, biosecurity in the lab. But we have yet to receive full uh, and open cooperation from China to be able to really understand those earliest cases. Dr. Van der Kove, um, earlier this year, the WHO declared that COVID-19 no longer qualifies as a global health emergency. But that certainly doesn't mean that COVID-19 is no longer with us, right? I mean, the pandemic has not come to an end, correct? That's right. The emergency of COVID was declared over, but the threat is not. This virus is with us. The virus is circulating in all countries. We are we have a really sharp decline in surveillance and reporting. So we don't have good visibility on how much this virus is circulating in every country, only that we know that it is. We are seeing increases in case reporting in a number of countries, but more worrying is that we are seeing increases in hospitalization in the Americas and in Europe where there's good reporting. We're also seeing increases in deaths, increases in emissions to ICU four years in. And this shouldn't be happening, given that we have tools that can actually prevent people from needing hospitalization, developing severe disease and dying. The fact that the virus is mutating and changing, um, what does that say about the vaccines still being able to provide good protection against getting very sick? So the virus is evolving, uh, and we're seeing new variants being detected um, regularly. And this is something that we expect to continue. With so much circulation, the virus will mutate and more variants will emerge. What we don't know is if the variants will become more severe or less severe. The worrying um, possibility is that we would have a more severe variant. And as you've pointed out, we need to make sure that our countermeasures work, that our diagnostics can still detect cases and put patients into that clinical care pathway, that our antivirals will work, our other therapeutics will work and that our vaccines will continue to provide protection against severe disease and death. 
So surveillance remains vitally important to be able to see what is circulating, what it means in terms of its impact in the human population, but also to look at immune escape, to look at if the vaccines need to be updated. And we have a process that's been put in place with our technical advisory groups for virus evolution, looking at the variants themselves to characterize each of them, to say if they are variants of interest or variants of concern. And our technical advisory group for COVID-19 vaccine composition looks at the compositions of the current vaccines to see if updates need to be made. There are some updates that are coming out in terms of the vaccines, but vaccination and boosting, particularly among those who are most at risk, over 60, over 70, people who are immunocompromised, people with underlying conditions, make sure that they get that additional dose, that booster dose. If you haven't had a booster dose in the last six to 12 months, get one. Do not wait. Dr. Van Kerkhove, certainly we've seen that around the world, um, vigilance has dropped. People are much more relaxed when it comes to COVID-19. I want to ask you, how much has surveillance of COVID-19 decreased the world over? And from your vantage point, are governments being vigilant enough? So surveillance has dropped significantly, and this puts us in a disadvantaged position to really understand what is in circulation, what impact it is having. So we can't, governments can't keep up the surveillance that they had at the peak of the pandemic. And what we're doing right now is working with governments to calibrate these systems going forward. What is the right amount of surveillance that is necessary? Too many countries right now are declining surveillance too much in terms of how much the virus is actually circulating. So we need that to be ramped up to be able to look at trends and look at trends in severity and hospitalizations and ICU, and not just looking at it within their own countries to take um, steps to mitigate those measures, but to report that to us so that we can make assessments, risk assessments at regional and at global levels. But we need countries to remain vigilant. Individuals are living their lives they, because population level immunity has increased and they have some protection against severe disease and death, but governments can't drop the ball. Governments still need to remain vigilant for this virus in the context of everything else, not COVID only, but COVID in the context of influenza and RSV and other infectious diseases, but also in the context of floods and droughts and fires, um, to be able to make sure that this is a disease that we manage better. We can do much more to protect people against infection, protect people against developing severe disease and dying, not at the expense of other programs and other diseases, but we have to get this response right. And that's what we're working on. How do we calibrate this response as we go forward? So much more work needs to be done to be able to achieve this. Dr. Maria Van Kerkhove, the COVID-19 technical lead at the World Health Organization. Thank you so much for joining us on Inside Story. Great to talk to you and great to get your perspective. Thank you. Thanks for having me. All right, let's go ahead and bring in our guests. Joining us from Norwich in the United Kingdom is Dr. Paul Hunter. He's professor in medicine at the University of East Anglia. Dr. Patrick Tang joins us by Skype from here in Doha. He is division chief of microbiology at Sidra Medicine. And joining by Skype from Bristol in the United Kingdom is Dr. Gabriel Scali. He's professor of public health at Bristol University. A warm welcome to each of you, and thanks for joining us today on Inside Story. Patrick, let me start with you today. Um, what danger does COVID-19 now pose, and how much cause for concern is there at this particular time? First of all, thank you for having me on your show. Um, COVID-19 now um, has to be looked at in perspective of all the other respiratory viruses that are also circulating and all the other public health uh, uh, emergencies that we have to deal with right now. So, so what's happened from the beginning of the outbreak to now is that we've built up a lot of immunity, both through our vaccination campaigns as well as through natural infections. So much of the world has immunity either through one of those or both of those routes. So we're in a much better position to uh, handle new waves of the, the infection now, uh, but it still remains a danger because the virus is evolving in a way that's faster than some of the other viruses that, that we normally we have had, like influenza, RSV, and these other viruses. Um, so, so there's still a chance that it can become more serious or that it could be able to transmit in a more efficient manner than it is right now and, and have some sort of immune escape over the, the built up immunity that we have in our population. So we definitely need vigilance, but it has to be put in perspective of all the other things we face now. Paul, uh, Patrick was talking there about the, uh, the new waves of COVID-19 and, and the threats they pose. Let me ask you, from your perspective, how much of a danger is the wave that we are currently experiencing? 
Well, I think that there's a lot of things going on at the moment. The, there's the two new variants, the EG.5 and the uh, BA.2.86, that are, have been relatively recently uh, described. The most recent one, which has got a lot of mutations, uh, has caused, I think, more concern, although at the moment it is still only responsible for less than about 1% or 2% uh, of infections in Europe. But that, that may well change. There are a lot of mutations with that, in gen in, but many of those mutations we've seen before. So it's been very difficult to judge how much more of a problem this uh, new variant will be uh, ultimately. They, um, some of the initial laboratory studies are looking that it might not be quite as bad as we had thought initially, but I think it's still very early days and we need to really uh, monitor it carefully over the coming weeks before we can actually make a proper judgment. Gabriel, uh, Paul was talking there about uh, mutations. Um, the virus, as we know, it mutates, it changes all the time. Do vaccines still provide good protection against getting very sick? Oh, I, th I think there's no doubt that uh, vaccination should remain uh, a really important part of programs in countries to, uh, to combat COVID-19. And unfortunately, however, some countries are restricting the level of vaccination, restricting the levels of boosters. And we've got to remember that it's not just protecting the individual who has COVID, but it's also protecting other people, people who have uh, vulnerabilities, who are immune suppressed, and we know COVID is really, really dangerous in that situation. And we've seen during the worst of the pandemic really bad outbreaks in, in, in hospitals where people uh, were very vulnerable. So to protect the vulnerable, we need to keep up, keep up the levels of vaccination. We need to change the vaccine. And that's happening, work's happening to try and catch up with the latest variants. So it's a, a, a constant process. And the other constant process has to be vigilance. And I think it's really unfortunate that countries are cutting back on their public health monitoring. Uh, and, and in fact, many countries uh, have a weak, uh, haven't, well, they haven't strengthened their public health systems. We need stronger public health systems uh, across all countries in order not just to deal with COVID, but to deal with other threats as well. Hey, Gabriel, let me just follow up with you because you make a good point about, you know, being concerned that governments, as you said, really aren't doing enough. Um, the fact that we went through this pandemic and that so many countries around the world were caught unawares. Um, how much concern do you have that we're going to get caught unaware again? And, and why do you think that even after experiencing um, uh, COVID-19, um, there is still this reluctance to invest more in public health programs? It is very strange, isn't it? I, I think when you look at the the sheer scale of COVID and what it did across the world, it was such a shock in so many ways for so many countries, economically and socially, educationally, in all sorts of ways. And when vaccination came along and uh, we managed to get COVID under control to some extent, I think there was a, a collective sigh of relief and a real wish to put it behind us. Uh, and I think that's probably the reason. We haven't really looked hard yet, though there are countries inquiring into how their, their poor performance. Uh, we haven't really seen uh, the investment in public health systems and monitoring and surveillance, and also the, the investment in our, our infrastructure, just basic infrastructure like ventilation to make sure that people in schools and hospitals and factories and in, in all sorts of places can have access to clean air because clean air is the biggest protection we have. Patrick, um, do we know if the latest iterations of the, of the vaccine um, are effective against newer variants of COVID like EG5? So we do know that the new vaccines, they're, they're actually, you probably wouldn't even call them boosters anymore. They actually contain a very different virus. It's the XBB uh, variant uh, of COVID-19. And, and that one is shown to be effective against all of these sub-lineages uh, that you're talking about. So um, we should expect that it should give good um, protection for people that are vulnerable, like elderly people, immunocompromised people, and people who have other uh, serious comorbidities.
Paul, do you have a, an idea of where we are at the moment when it comes to vaccination rates uh, around the world? I mean, are, are people still more or less getting vaccinated, getting the boosters, or, or has that really plummeted? I think it's it, it slumped. I think the, um, one of the things that I would point out is that although there's two elements of the immunity to COVID, one is the immunity to infection, and the other is protection against severe disease if you do get infected. Or none of the vaccines actually give very, or indeed infection, give very durable protection against infection. But so far, at least, we've seen very good uh, protection against severe disease lasting many months. And indeed, if you've actually had a vaccine and been infected, uh, and recovered from the infection already, that gives you a very good protection against needing to go into hospital if and when you do get in, in, um, an infection. And the, the vaccines do reduce transmission of infection, but, but not for very long, unfortunately. And, and the, looking at all the data, it's only about uh, six months. In six months after vaccination, more than half of people have lost the protection against uh, infection but not against severe disease. And, and some of that loss is because of the appearance of new escape mutations. Some of it is actually because of declining uh, short-lived uh, immunity, which, you, to be honest, isn't a surprise because short duration of immunity to respiratory infections is something that we've known about for decades. Mm. Paul, l let me also ask you, I mean, we should take this opportunity to point out, you know, how remarkable it was how quickly a, a vaccine was actually developed for COVID-19 and how quickly the, these boosters and, and new iterations of the vaccine uh, seem to be coming out and, and getting approved by different uh, regulatory agencies. Um, but we do know that the virus mutates, uh, th that it changes and it yeah. spreads. Um, how much of a challenge does that pose to the scientists working on developing the newer iterations of the vaccines, the ones that can cope with the new threats? Yeah, I mean, we've already spoken about the latest, the, the vaccine that has just been licensed in the States is uh, based on a XXB1 virus, which was very common early on in the year, uh, around about Easter, but now is actually pretty rare. It's, it's on its way out and it's been replaced by other uh, variants, particularly at the moment, the EG.5, uh, which is... Um, probably the, the commonest individual variant in mo many countries now. And so already the, the virus, the variant that this new vaccine was directed at has already pretty much uh, died out. But we are still seeing fairly reasonable protection against, especially against severe disease, but also against infection from uh, any of the viruses against any of the new uh, variants circulating. So when people think about the new variants bypassing immunity from vaccine, it's never a total thing. It's always gradations. And, uh, and you know, once when you've got, when you're talking about hybrid immunity in people who've been vaccinated and had an infection, and most of us globally, Almost all of us globally have actually mm. already had one or two infections. The, looking at the ONS data in the UK, in England, mm. probably we've had somewhere of the order of about two and a half infections per person um, at the moment. But we're still seeing severe disease in the more vulnerable. So taking together, I think the, the vaccines for people who need them for prevention of severe disease is still something mm. that we'll be giving for a few years yet. But... Uh, you know, mm. we are uh, coming towards some sort of mm. equilibrium now with the virus. Uh, Patrick, uh, in many parts of the world, testing for COVID has been massively scaled back. How difficult does it make it um, when it comes to knowing how many people might have it and, and, and knowing how to deal with it more going forward? That, that's a big challenge, you know, probably in every country around the world as the amount of clinical and public health testing of people that are sick um, is going down. We, we have very little uh, data to guide us in terms of how we manage um, the, the ongoing uh, waves of COVID-19. But in many countries, they have instituted more passive ways of uh, environmental surveillance. So doing things like wastewater surveillance and looking at the levels of the virus that are persisting in the 
wastewater, and that can reflect the activity and sometimes even um, predates the, the waves of virus uh, in, in the community. So, so there are alternative ways of looking at it. Um, and, and of course, you are right that our normal ways of surveillance are, are lacking right now. Uh, Gabriel, it looked like you wanted to jump in. I saw you reacting uh, just then. Uh, did you want to go ahead? Well, I, I think what we have to do is not rely totally on the, the sort of magic bullet of, of the science and the vaccine and so on. And we've got to do some really fundamental stuff. And that means putting in good ventilation systems, good filtration systems, so that we can all have clean air. And we don't have to go back um, you, you know, a long way to find out how effective those were and the way in which we rebuilt in many societies, particularly in uh, uh, the Northern Hemisphere, uh, we rebuilt lots of our buildings to cope with tuberculosis when it was a huge uh, pandemic um, across the Northern Hemisphere countries. And, and we did change things. We did rebuild schools and we built in ventilation into hospitals in, a, in, in new and innovative ways to try and reduce the spread of that airborne disease. A good investment now, not just in the surveillance of the public health systems that some of my colleagues have been talking about, but also in making places healthy for us to live and work in so that uh, we can be protected not just from COVID, but from all of the other respiratory th threats that there are that might be spread in our houses, schools, shops or wherever it is we are. Patrick, it, it looked to me like you were reacting to some of what Gabriel was saying. Did you want to jump in as well? Yeah, that's absolutely true. There, there are many other measures uh, that we can put in to try to reduce the burden of respiratory diseases and, and the threat of uh, other uh, similar pandemics from happening. So, so what's happened now is during the pandemic, many of the viruses that we normally deal with, like influenza, RSV, uh, their patterns have also shifted as well, too. So there's a little bit of unpredictability in many of the respiratory viruses. So we really have to be on our toes uh, in terms of being ready with back, the right vaccines, being ready with uh, all these other countermeasures and, and just improving our ability to, to reduce uh, transmission within our indoor environment. So, so those are absolutely important things that we have to do. And, and of course, we can't forget um, that we have to maintain funding for public health. And, and I think that's something that many people want to forget about after the pandemic. And uh, that, that's something that we have to keep telling the story that, that a lot of these viruses are still circulating. There are outbreaks every year all the time with different viruses that, that may not make it into the news. Yeah, Patrick, that's a good point. And, and before COVID-19, you had uh, scientists, uh, you had doctors, uh, organizations uh, saying that governments should be investing more in public health. I mean, it's not new to certainly hear those warnings. Um, do you think that message is actually being heeded? Do you, do you think that, that more governments are actually taking that into account and, and doing more or are prepared to do more going forward? I think we have to ride the momentum, right? And it's it's really easy to to lose that story amongst all the other things that are happening around the world. And I think you know, in the past, uh, outbreaks cost the world you know tens of billions of dollars every year in in lost global economic output, right? So so I think there definitely is an economic case for it, and and there's probably a case for it in almost everything, whether it's our society, mm -hmm. our education. Uh, there, there's definitely a benefit to preventing outbreaks and, and reducing the burden of infectious diseases globally. Um, but, but we have to, we need examples for, for people and for governments to see uh, for them to take action. And I think it's important that we keep uh, um, vigilance about COVID-19 and keep telling the stories and remembering what happened during COVID-19 so that we, we still are able to spur action and, and continued action against uh, uh, future pandemics. Paul, I, I saw you reacting as well. It looked like you might have wanted to add to uh, to what Patrick was saying there. Please go ahead. Yeah, I think public health has always suffered from the problem that when it does its job right, nobody notices it. And when it does its job not right, then people notice. And I think that's the issue. There are numerous uh, episodes over our recent history of um, money being saved on public health initiatives that was then dwarfed by the costs of coping with the outcome that uh, up until then public health had been prevented. And, and uh, Gabriel mentioned tuberculosis. That 
you know, the, uh, the, the cutbacks in the US um, uh, tuberculosis program in a uh, few decades back was followed by uh, very much more problems with tuberculosis that cost far more than the original savings achieved. So, mm. yeah, it is a problem. Politicians generally have short memories. Uh, they, uh, you know, they, and we will, it's the same with vaccine. It's always easier to vaccinate people to, uh, against influenza the year mm. after a pandemic than the year before a pandemic. And you know, this is a problem, and how we deal with this, both in, in public conception and in political uh, will, is, uh, mm. is, I think, one of the biggest issues that we've got to face in coming years. Gabriel, it looked like you wanted to jump in, so I'm going to give you the opportunity. We don't have a whole lot of time left, so but before I let you talk, I also want to ask you about the fact that all around the world, it does feel like many are acting like the pandemic is over, but the simple truth is that it just isn't, correct? Oh, absolutely. And I, I think one of the things we haven't touched on at all, which some economic commentators and some finance departments or treasury departments and governments are commenting on, is the sheer burden of long COVID. The people who have had COVID and, and the, the small percentage of them who go on to have really long lasting and very disabling symptoms of all sorts. And, and that burden needs to be factored in and we need to uh, not only look after them well, but we need to put all our effort into trying to keep COVID under control so as not to add to those burdens. And, and they are big economic as well as social and terrible health burdens on the individuals and their families. Uh, so I think that's, that's really, really important. International cooperation is absolutely vital around issues such as the distribution of, of, of vaccines, and we know that. But each country as well needs to look at how they've done in terms of vaccination, because I, I know examples where there's been a real social class divide in terms of the uptake of vaccination. And some of the people at the, uh, at, at the least well-off community level, uh, both geographically and, and maybe uh, issues of, 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 of race and color and, and level of education and so on, uh, are not getting the vaccines that really would help them. So we need to be putting the effort now into trying to get to people who maybe haven't been vaccinated at all through the course of the pandemic. All right. Well, we have run out of time, so we're going to have to leave the conversation there. Thanks so much to all of our guests, Dr. Paul Hunter, Dr. Patrick Tang, and Dr. Gabriel Scali. And earlier, thanks to Dr. Maria Van Kerkhove. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on X, formerly known as Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Mohammed Jamjoum, and the whole team here, bye for now.